Hi everyone, Ms. Luva here coming at you with a video on intermolecular forces. This is actually the second video that I'm making. Um, the first one had some technical issues with the sound, so hopefully this one will come out better. And for the first time, I'm trying um, the video where you can see my face at the bottom. So, hi! Um, we'll see if it works out or not. Okay, so like I said, we're going to go ahead and dive right into intermolecular forces. So intermolecular forces are the forces of attraction between molecules. Um, and so it's important that we don't confuse them with bonding, which of course is intramolecular forces. So remember, intramolecular forces is um, bonding why one atom bonds to another atom to create a molecule. But when we're talking about intermolecular forces, we're talking about why molecules are attracted to each other. So for example, water, when we go to get water out of the faucet, we don't get one molecule at a time, we get a bunch of molecules stuck together. So why are water molecules attracted to each other? That's what we talk about in intermolecular forces. It's a force of attraction between molecules. Okay, so here's a picture to help us understand that. We see hydrochloric acid um, bonding to itself. So HCl bonded to another HCl. The reason the H nonmetal bonds to the Cl, also a nonmetal, is because of a covalent bond. But that's actually not what we're talking about anymore. That was for our last unit. What we're focused on now is the fact that one HCl gets attracted to another HCl, and that's going to be the intermolecular force that we're really focused on here. Um, so there's a difference between bonding and intermolecular forces, and we're going to be focused on molecules being attracted to each other in this unit. Um, now, it is important to note that intermolecular attractions are actually much weaker than intramolecular attractions. So ionic, covalent, and metallic bonds are much stronger than any of the molecule-to-molecule -molecule interactions that we're going to talk about today. Okay, um, internet, uh, excuse me, intermolecular forces can be used to explain the physical properties of a substance, and so that's one of the reasons we study them. We can use intermolecular forces to compare um, or explain differences in boiling point, melting point, vapor pressure, and even to help justify why a substance is in a certain state, solid, liquid, or gas at room temperature. And so we'll really focus on that um, tomorrow. There are going to be three types, main types of intermolecular forces that we're going to talk about. The dipole-dipole force, which um, occurs between polar molecules. Hydrogen bonding, um, which is a result of a H bonding to an O, N, or an F, and we'll talk about that more in detail. And then London dispersion forces, which apply to all molecules, and it um, is a result of temporary dipoles. So that's just a little preview of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, just a quick reminder here, this is an image from our textbook. It is important when thinking about intermolecular forces, which often leads to a discussion about states of matter, just to have this picture in our head to remember that gases are far apart and particles move quickly, um, that solids are super organized and ordered, all the molecules are very tightly packed in with very little movement, and liquids are something in between, still tightly packed in, but now we have a little bit of movement. Um, so it's important to keep these pictures in our head um, when we start to think about intermolecular forces, and you'll see that that um, comes up soon. Okay, so let's go ahead and dive into the first intermolecular force, which is the dipole-dipole force. Um, so remember that dipole-dipole forces are going to be medium in strength, so not the strongest, not the weakest, and they're going to apply to polar molecules. So like I said, dipole-dipole forces are the forces of attraction that occur between polar molecules, and they're a result of the separation of charge that is caused by the dipole moment. So you'll remember from our last unit, we learned about dipole moments, which are caused by a difference in electronegativity when um, molecules do not share their electrons evenly. So here's an example. This is HBr, okay? So um, obviously I know that H is smaller than Br. I can look at my periodic table and see that Br is several periods below H, and so it's got several more energy levels and therefore much larger. So I'm just going to go ahead and label my HBrs everywhere here. 
And we also know that Br has a higher electronegativity than H. And so that means because H is very non-electronegative. And so that means that we have a dipole moment that looks like this. HBr, 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 and here I have it flipped so it'll go HBr. Okay, and so that is going to mean that every H is partially positive and every Br is partially negative based on the dipole moment. And this is a permanent dipole moment. Br is always more electronegative than H, and so we always have these, um, this, excuse me, separation of charge. We always have this separation of charge. And so you can see right here that, oops, sorry about that. Let's see if we can get this working here. There we go. I'm just gonna erase this so I have some space. Um, so we can see that we have the partial negatives and the partial positives um, labeled. So what would happen if an HBr is bonding to an HBr, or excuse me, is getting attracted to another HBr? Would it occur like this, option number one, or would it occur like this, option number two? Hopefully, you guys thought to yourself that it would actually be option number two. We would see that the partial positive that's sitting on that H is going to bond to the, excuse me, get attracted to, I should say, the partial negative of the other molecule. The partial negative on this HBr will be attracted to the partial positive on this HBr. Alternatively, in option one, this most likely would not happen because we know that um, like charges actually repel each other. So this and this would not get attracted to each other. They would actually repel each other. And so this wouldn't happen. And so that's really all a dipole-dipole force is. When molecules are um, polar, they have a dipole moment, meaning that one end is going to be partially positive and one end is going to be partially negative. The molecules will arrange themselves in such a way that the positive and negative ends of different molecules will align to be attracted to each other and therefore have some intramolecular forces. The dashed line is um, showing the dipole-dipole force. Remember, when talking about intermolecular forces, we are not talking about this bond right here. We're not talking about why the H bonds to the Br. We're focused on the HBr molecule bonding to the HBr molecule via an intermolecular force, in this case, a dipole-dipole force. So here's a second example. This is CH3Cn. Um, again, this is a polar molecule, and it's polar because the N over here um, is going to make everything uneven. And so it turns out that the blue N is where the partial negative lies, and near the CH3 part over here is where the partial positive lies. And so you'll be able to see that we have um, a positive end be attracted to a negative end right there. Should try that again. Okay, and then here a positive end and a negative end, a positive end and a negative end, and I'm just highlighting all of those. There's several of them around here. Okay, now notice this is in solid CH3CN. And the only forces that we see are these attractive forces of a positive end to a negative end. And that's awesome. Now, if we were to give this solid a little bit of kinetic energy via increasing the temperature, then the molecules might start to move around a little bit, right? Because they have more kinetic energy. And if they start to move around a little bit, they might switch into the liquid phase. And if they do that, they might orient themselves a little bit differently. And so you'll see here, we have liquid CH3Cn. And again, primarily, we have the negative ends and the positive ends lining up. But every so often, we'll have a negative end and a negative end have some repulsive forces. Here's a positive end and a positive end have a repulsive force. And that might happen, but overall, we still have more positive and negatives lining up therefore giving us overall pretty strong intermolecular attractions. So it is possible to have some repulsive dipole-dipole forces, 
but the attractive forces will always outweigh the dipole-dipole force, uh, excuse me, the um, repulsive forces. The molecules will orient themselves in a way to maximize the attractive forces. Um, so again, a dipole-dipole force is just a force that happens between two polar molecules. Because there's a separation of charge, we have these positive and negative ends. Molecules can align to maximize the attraction. Some other important notes about dipole-dipole forces. Um, the stronger the dipole, the stronger the intermolecular forces. So if the molecule is, um, has a really strong dipole, meaning a huge difference in electronegativity or a really uneven distribution of charge, then the intermolecular force is going to be a little bit stronger. Um, like I just said, the more uneven the charge distribution, the higher the intermolecular force. So here's an example. We have propane, which is CH3CH2CH3. That's actually a nonpolar molecule. And so because it's nonpolar, we know that it doesn't actually have dipole-dipole interactions. So I'm just going to ignore that one for right now. Then we have CH3OCH3. Now that seems pretty um, even, right? CH3 and O in the middle and a CH3. But it turns out when we look at that molecule, um, there are a couple of lone pairs on this O. And you might remember that lone pairs always cause a molecule to be a little bit polar. And so this molecule is actually polar. Then we have CH3CHO. Okay, we definitely know that's going to be uneven because it's got a CH3 on one side, a CHO on the other side. And then CH3CN is an even more polar molecule because the N causes a further separation of charge. And so as we go across here, we see the molecules are getting more and more polar, more and more uneven, and therefore the dipole-dipole force is getting stronger and stronger. Okay, awesome. So let's move on to hydrogen bonding. Um, the important thing to know about hydrogen bonding is that hydrogen bonds are super strong and that they apply to a very specific set of polar molecules. Now, one thing that's super frustrating is hydrogen bonding is actually an intermolecular force. So remember, we have three types of bonds, ionic, covalent, metallic. Those are our intramolecular forces. Then we're going to have three types of intermolecular forces, dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonds, and London dispersion. It is a little bit misleading that hydrogen bonds are a type of intermolecular force, but can't rename scientific things, so we'll roll with it, okay? So hydrogen bonding, what do we need to know about it? Um, hydrogen bonds are the forces of attraction that result from a hydrogen atom that's attached to a highly electronegative atom, like an O, N, or F, and a nearby small electronegative atom, O, N, or F, in another molecule. I don't know about you, but what's that like makes no sense. That's such a long definition and it's quite confusing. But as soon as we look at a couple examples, you're going to see that um, hydrogen bonds are actually really easy to recognize. Okay, Hydrogen bonding is basically a souped up dipole-dipole force. So it is essentially a dipole-dipole force, but it involves very certain atoms or very specific atoms. So let's take a look. Here's an example, water. Water displays hydrogen bonding. Um, in fact, it is one of the most critical features of water, the fact that it does display this hydrogen bonding. And so what we can see is water, which we know is a polar molecule, and it has a permanent dipole going this way and a permanent dipole going this way, making oxygen partially negative and hydrogen partially positive. So what happens, obviously, is the partially positive end of one water aligns with the partially negative end of the other water, leading to this intermolecular force that we're observing. Okay, now this some people might call a dipole-dipole force, but the difference is it involves very specific atoms. So you can see that we have a hydrogen that's bonded to an oxygen, and that hydrogen is having an intermolecular attraction with an oxygen of another molecule. Whenever this happens, we have hydrogen bonding. So we're looking for hydrogen with oxygen 
hydrogen with fluorine or hydrogen with nitrogen. O, F, and N are the three elements that are part of hydrogen bonding. So in order to have hydrogen bonding, we need to meet two criteria. One is a hydrogen needs to be connected to an O, N, or F. Two is that that same hydrogen needs to have an intermolecular attraction with an O, N, or F. Now, it doesn't mean that it has to be like an O over here and an O over here. If this is an O and this were, let's say, an N, that would still be a hydrogen bond. But we want to be on the lookout for O's, N's, and F's connected to hydrogens. And basically, the reason we single these out is because O, F, and N are highly electronegative atoms, so they cause a big difference in electronegativity and therefore cause this intermolecular force to be super strong. So a hydrogen bond is just a dipole-dipole force, but it's a really strong one, and it's really strong because it involves hydrogen, a really low electronegative atom, and O, N, or F, a really high electronegative atom, and therefore that difference is very strong, making the bond very strong, excuse me, the force very strong, okay? Let's take a look at another example here. Um, hold on, my charger is stuck. Okay. Here is ethanol, which is CH3OH, okay? Um, and again, you can see that the intermolecular attraction is highlighted right here, and ethanol meets this criteria. We have a hydrogen that's attached to an O, N, or F, having an intermolecular attraction with an oxygen. So again, we have a strong hydrogen bond. Some other important things about hydrogen bonds, like I've mentioned a bunch of times, they're super strong. And it is important to remember that just because there's an H in the molecule, it doesn't mean there's automatically hydrogen bonding. For example, CH4, some students will see that hydrogen and say, oh, there's hydrogen bonding. But there isn't because in CH4, the H is not bonded to an O, N, or F, so we cannot have hydrogen bonding here, okay? So it's important to remember that. And I think I just have a picture here um, to remind you about how strong the hydrogen bonds are. Okay, cool. So now we're on to our London dispersion forces, um, which is the weakest type of intermolecular attraction, but there are often a lot of London dispersion forces. So all combined, they actually account for quite a few of the intermolecular attractions that occur. Um, what's special about London dispersion forces is they actually apply to everything. So every molecule has London dispersion forces. So what are London dispersion forces? Let's back up for a second. You might think that nonpolar molecules or things like noble gases have no intermolecular attraction. So think about something like um, nitrogen, right? That's a non, or that is a nonpolar molecule. Everything is evenly distributed. So it can't have dipole dipole forces because it's not polar. And it doesn't have hydrogen bonds, there's no hydrogens present. So then you might think, oh, there are no intermolecular attractions, okay? The same thing for something like helium, right? It's a noble gas. We know it's relatively unreactive, so it's unreactive, just has the complete octet around it, or actually, sorry, not octet, it's helium, so it's got a duet, just two. Everything's even, um, so no intermolecular attractions. But our experience tells us otherwise, right? We know that liquid nitrogen exists, and we know that liquid helium exists. And maybe you didn't know that, but liquid helium is actually used as a refrigerant, most likely part of your refrigerator at home. So since liquid nitrogen and liquid helium exist, we know that nitrogen can get attracted to itself. Otherwise, it would always be in its gas form. But since it can get attracted to itself, it can create a liquid. We know that helium, same thing, while mostly it's a gas, it can form a liquid, which means intermolecular forces are possible, okay? So the London dispersion forces actually explain this, and they are the forces of attraction that arise based on the creation of temporary dipoles due to the constant motion of electrons. So here's what that means, okay? Um, basically, we follow the electron cloud model, 
we know that atoms and molecules have these electron clouds and electrons are constantly whizzing around um, around the atom or the molecule. Okay, often when we draw this, we draw a very even distribution of our electrons. However, in reality, since electrons are moving around randomly, at any given moment, electrons might not be evenly distributed. And if they're unevenly distributed, wherever more electrons are, there is going to be a buildup of negative charge just for a split second. And the opposite side will have a positive charge just for a split second. And that's what we call a temporary dipole. If something has a temporary dipole, it for a second feels positive and negative on two ends, then it can be attracted to something else with a temporary dipole that's feeling negative and positive, and we'll see an attraction there. And that's what a London dispersion force is. So here I have, um, Let's see, I want to, yes, I want to keep that. Here, I have a YouTube video queued up. Hopefully, um, this is where things went back. Oops. Okay, this is where things went badly in the last video, but I think we got it working. Um, so I have a YouTube video queued up just to show you really quickly um, a demonstration of how those temporary dipoles can get created. I won't speak on top of it. I think maybe that was the issue last time. So let's now we see this here is an atom. It has electrons equally distributed around a positively charged nucleus. Since electrons are always in motion, sometimes there are more on one side than on the other for a brief period of time. So here we see the creation of the temporary dipole. Right, for a brief period of time, those electrons that used to be evenly distributed are not evenly distributed. In this brief period, the sides of the atom will have become partially negative and partially positive. This is called an induced dipole, and they are only temporary. I prefer to call this type of thing a temporary dipole as opposed to an induced dipole. We'll learn in a second that an induced dipole is something else. The partially negative sides would attract the partially positive sides from all the particles. But after a while, they would return to their original shape and the attraction between them fades. And that is... Okay, so that was just um, to help us kind of visualize what's happening there. Let me get back to our PowerPoints. Boom. Okay, um, so we saw that the partial negative side um, of a temporary dipole can find a partial positive side of a... What's happening? Hmm. Just going to hit pause on the video and see if I can. Okay. Hopefully we'll be in good shape now. So um, the partial negative part of a temporary um, dipole will find a partial positive charge to a temporary dipole. I'm going to leave that um, graphic alone so that I don't have any more trouble. And um, we'll see a little bit of an attraction. But obviously, since that's a temporary attraction, um, it's not very strong. It's actually quite weak. Okay. Now, here's the diagram from our textbook um, that shows us helium. Um, so up here, we see helium kind of evenly distributed in both these. Those are two different atoms of helium with the electrons evenly distributed. And so therefore, um, here you can see that there is no dipole, right? Um, everything is even. Here we can see that one atom begins to have an unevenness to it. The electrons have moved to one side. And so because of that, we get this temporary dipole down here where we have a partial positive where there are no electrons and we have a partial negative and that's the creation of our temporary dipole. Now because atom B is close to atom A, the partial negative of atom B actually encourages atom A to become partially positive over here. That's what we call an induced dipole. So because atom B had this temporary moment of being uneven, it actually induced a dipole to atom A. And so now atom A's electrons have moved in such a way 
that we have a partial positive here that the partial negative can get attracted to, and then we have this extra partial negative on the outside. And so a lot happens with London dispersion forces. Part of it is just electrons are whizzing around randomly and create these temporary dipoles. But once a temporary dipole is created, then it can induce more temporary dipoles on other um, nearby atoms or molecules. Okay, But again, it's all temporary, so it's all very quick and very weak. Um, now here I have a, another video. Um, I think this one should work okay. Let's see. Okay, um, now just watch the middle carbon dioxide. This is supposed to represent carbon dioxide, which you might remember is a nonpolar linear molecule. And I want you to focus on that middle one in there. Electrons are whizzing around normally quite evenly, but it's possible for one of them to suddenly get this temporary dipole. And if that occurs, we see a separation of charge. Now you'll see that because of that, all the atoms and molecules close to it are suddenly going to have these induced dipoles um, where a positive end and a negative end want to get together. Next thing you know, there's a bunch of temporary dipoles causing quite a bit of London dispersion forces. Okay, awesome. So some important notes on London dispersion forces. Um, they are the weakest of the intermolecular forces. They apply to all substances, but they are the only intermolecular force that acts upon nonpolar substances and noble gases. London dispersion forces um, get stronger the more polarizable the substance it is. The substance is so. The more polarizable the substance, the stronger the London dispersion force. What does it mean to be polarizable? Well, our book uses the word squashiness of the electron cloud. This is supposed to be an of, uh, squashiness of the electron cloud. And so they have some diagrams where they're showing the electron cloud kind of getting squished. For me, that doesn't make as much sense. So instead, I think about polarizable as being how uneven the charge distribution can get. So for example, the more electrons there are, the more there can be an unevenness because a ton of electrons could be on one side and few electrons on the other. And so to me, the more electrons there are, the more polarizable something is. Additionally, the larger something is, the more polarizable it is because we can have that distance between the negative and the positive ends being very big. And a dipole is that separation of charge. So the it's going to be more polarizable if the molecule is bigger. And then we just know from um, our periodic table that for the most part, larger mole molecules mean the molecules heavier. So the higher the molar mass or the higher the molecular weight, the more polarizable it is. So when we're trying to compare how strong London dispersion forces are, we're going to think about how many electrons there are, how big the molecule is, and how heavy it is. The other piece is that molecular shape can have an impact on how strong the London dispersion forces are. And that has to do with contact area. So take a look at this picture. We have n-pentane and neopentane. Again, this is a picture from our textbook. And we can see that in terms of interaction, there is a lot of space here for London dispersion forces to happen. And so there's a lot of space for attractions to occur. Whereas here, based on the molecular shape, there's not as much space for the intermolecular attractions to occur. So n-pentane is going to have stronger London dispersion forces than neopentane. Now, I want to point out to you um, a vocabulary word that I'm not sure if you know, but we should definitely know for our AP exam, and that's the word isomer. So n-pentane and neopentane are isomers of each other. Those are molecules with the same chemical makeup, but a different structure. So both of these molecules represent C5H12. Both of them represent C5H12. And if you were to count carefully, you'll see five carbons. Well, if we could see everything. Um, here we have these space filling mol uh, models, so it's a little bit harder. But um, both molecules are C5H12. 
but the difference between them is how those atoms are actually arranged. And so when we have molecules with the same chemical makeup, but a different arrangement, we say that they're isomers of each other. And in this case, the n-pentane isomer is going to have stronger intermolecular attractions than the neopentane because there's literally more area for those attractions to occur. Okay, now I know I said that there were only three um, intermolecular forces, but that's not actually true. It's just that this fourth one, which is ion dipole interactions, is one that we've already covered um, and is super self-explanatory because it is exactly what it sounds like. An ion dipole interaction is an interaction between an ion and a molecule that has a dipole, which means a polar molecule. So the forces of attraction between an ion and a polar molecule. The, a cation will always be attracted to the negative end of a polar molecule, and an anion is always going to be attracted to a positive end of a polar molecule because we know that opposites attract. So here's an example, and we've actually talked about this when we were talking about solubility. This is sodium chloride, an aqueous solution. So that means sodium chloride dissolved in water. So here we have our sodium ion. I know that it's sodium because it's positive, also because it's larger. And here I have my chlorine ion. I know it's my chloride ion because it's the negatively charged one and it's smaller. So there are my ions. Now my polar molecules, are my water molecules, which are hydrating these ions. You can see that water, which we know is polar and has a dipole going like this, the negative end of water is aligning itself with the positive ion, but the positive end of water is aligning itself with the negative ion. And that's how ions become hydrated in order to dissolve. So this intermolecular attraction between the ion and the positive or negative end of water is what we call an ion dipole interaction. Okay, so what do they ask us on the AP exam? Mostly they ask us about what intermolecular forces are present and which ones are stronger. So here are some examples. Oh, well, sorry, first let me give you some information about how, they're, how to know what is present. First of all, London dispersion forces are always present. All atoms and molecules have London dispersion forces. So if it says list the intermolecular forces present, London dispersion forces is always the answer. Okay. Um, this will be the only answer if it's nonpolar or a noble gas. Okay. But this isn't a multiple choice situation. So when they say what intermolecular forces are present, it's not just London dispersion forces. It can be just London dispersion forces or it could be London dispersion forces and dipole-dipole forces. It could be London dispersion and dipole-dipole and hydrogen. So you want to list all of the different um, forces that are present. Polar molecules will have dipole-dipole forces. So a polar molecule would have both London dispersion and dipole-dipole forces. If we have that special hydrogen connected to an O, N, or F situation, then we're going to have some hydrogen bonding as well. So that's how you know what's present. And then, of course, if you have an ion and a polar molecule, we have the ion dipole force. Now, in terms of strength, ion dipole forces are the strongest. Hydrogen bonds are very strong as well. Now, dipole dipole forces are technically stronger than London dispersion forces um, because London dispersion forces are the weakest intermolecular forces. But when we actually look at that in nature, because there are so many temporary dipoles, often London dispersion forces account for more of the intermolecular attraction than the dipole-dipole forces do. So an individual dipole-dipole force is normally stronger than a single London dispersion force, but because there are tons of London dispersion forces um, occurring all the time, it is actually quite a strong force overall. Um, so I was always taught that it went like hydrogen bonds are the strongest, then dipole-dipole, then London dispersion. But in my more recent reading, I've realized that London dispersion forces, just because of their high volume, sometimes account for more of the intermolecular attraction than the dipole-dipole force does. Okay, this is um, a chart from our book as well that just helps you kind of figure it out. So, you know, it'll start with our ions present. Okay. 
If ions are present, you might just have a full-out ionic substance, okay? And if you have a full-out ionic substance, the only thing it's displaying is ionic bonding, which is the attraction of the K to the Br, okay? Um, there are no other um, forces there, and if that is happening, that's actually really strong. All of the other things that we're talking about involve um, covalent substances as well. And so the ion dipole force would be present if there is a polar molecule along with the ion. If there are no ions present, we might end up with something nonpolar, London dispersion. If it's just polar, it's going to be um, dipole dipole. And of course, if we have the ON or F, it's going to be hydrogen bonding. So this is a good chart to just take a look at and make sure that you can kind of do this in your head, which is what we're about to do on our last two sample problems. So list the substances in order of increasing strength, BACL2, H2CO, and HF, and NE, excuse me. So let's start here. I know that neon is a noble gas. So that means immediately I know there are only London dispersion forces here. Okay, let's see, HF. HF, ooh, is a polar molecule. It's not gonna be even. And I see the H connected to the F, which means, ooh, there's gonna be London dispersion forces. There's going to be hydrogen bonding, right? Because the H connected to the F and it's O, N, or F. So I know that there's hydrogen bonding there. Okay, CO, that's going to be polar um, because there's uneven distribution. And since it's polar, obviously everything has London dispersion. But then there's also going to be dipole, dipole forces there. Okay, H2, okay, that's nonpolar. And so um, nonpolar means there's only going to be London dispersion forces. And then BACL2, well, that's a metal with a non-metal, so that's just a normal ionic substance, um, which from the previous chart I just learned is the strongest. So I'm going to say BACL2 is going to have the strongest intermolecular forces. Boom. After that, I've got hydrogen bonding. Okay, done. So that takes care of this guy and this guy. All right, next, the guy with the London dispersion forces. I'm sorry, not the London dispersion forces, the dipole-dipole forces. Done. And now I'm left with two molecules, H2 and NE, that both only have London dispersion forces. And I have to differentiate between those two. So if you remember, atoms or molecules that have more electrons are bigger and are more massive, have more mass, than those are the ones that are more polarizable and therefore have more London dispersion forces. Neon meets all of those criteria. Neon has more electrons than hydrogen, it ha is bigger than hydrogen, and it weighs more than hydrogen. So neon is going to have more London dispersion forces than hydrogen, and that means the weakest intermolecular forces are happening with my H2. Awesome. So our last example, identify the intermolecular forces present in the following substances and identify which substances has the strongest intermolecular forces. Okay, so let's take a look. CH3, CH3, that seems pretty even to me. So I'm guessing that's a nonpolar molecule, which means it's gonna have London dispersion forces. Okay, CH3OH, okay, that's definitely polar. And everything has London dispersion forces. Ooh, and it has hydrogen bonding. And I recognize that because of the OH there, an H bonded to an O, N, or F. Okay, CH3, CH2, OH. Okay, that's definitely polar, uneven. London dispersion, because everything has London dispersion. And then again, I see the OH. So I know I have hydrogen bonding. Okay. So now if I'm trying to rank these, um, I know that my CH3CH3, which only has London dispersion forces, is going to be my weakest in terms of intermolecular forces. Cool, so that's the weakest. But I'm in a little bit of a situation here because I have two molecules that both have London dispersion forces and hydrogen bonds. And how do I differentiate between them? So 
I can't really differentiate between the hydrogen bonding. I know both have hydrogen bonding and hydrogen bonding is strong. So what I'm going to do is try to differentiate between the London dispersion forces. So since they both display hydrogen bonding, both are going to be much stronger than the CH3CH3. But now when I'm comparing them, CH3OH versus CH3CH2OH, I'm going to think to myself, well, this guy is more massive, larger, and has more electrons than this guy. So CH3CH2OH has more London dispersion forces. So total, that's going to have more intermolecular interactions than the CH3OH. Awesome. So we made it through the second run of this video. Hopefully, it's a better quality one. I know we had a couple hiccups in there, but we made it through. Um, tomorrow, we'll talk about how do we apply all this information to those physical properties of boiling point, melting point, vapor pressure, and so forth. I um, hope you guys have a lovely day. See you soon. Bye.